The Open University of Hong Kong recently hosted a conference on Culture in Translation, Reception of Chinese Literature in the World. In this conference presentation, Professor Mabel Lee from the University of Sydney explores the aesthetic vision of Gao Xingjian, the Chinese-born novelist, playwright, essayist, and translator. Professor Lee, as the translator of Gao's novel, Soul Mountain, has unique insights into Gao's ability to read and draw upon literatures in languages other than Chinese and to translate his psychic reality into his own writing. Gao Xingjian was born in China in 1940 and he achieved celebrity status in the early 1980s through the publication of his book, uh, Preliminary Exploration into the Art of Modern Fiction in 1981, and also through the staging in Beijing of his two plays, Zhe Du Xin Hao, Absolute Signal in 1982, and uh, Che Zhan, Bus Stop in 1983. His steady stream of writings captured the attention of a small number of academic translators from different parts of the world. Jurian Malmquist in Sweden, Noel and Lillian Dutre in France, Gilbert Fong in Hong Kong, and myself in Australia. Gao Xingjian was crowned 2000 Nobel Laureate for Literature on the basis of a corpus of works that he had written in Chinese, a significant part of which had also been published in French, English, and Swedish. By the year 2000, 32 productions of a number of his plays had been staged on all five continents. And 32 major exhibitions of his Chinese zinc paintings had been held throughout Europe and Asia and also the USA. It's worth considering the reception of Gao Xingjian's novel, Ling Shan, Soul Mountain was published in 1990. Translated by Noel and L Lillian Dutre, and published in 1995, the French edition was well received by readers. But as the translator of the English edition, I can testify that right up to the noble announcement, we were unable to find publishers in the USA or UK. The HarperCollins edition of Soul Mountain, with distribution rights only in Australia and New Zealand, was published in early July 2000, and before the Nobel announcement in early October, 4,000 copies had sold. On the other hand, 100 copies of the Chinese edition had sold in 10 years after it was published in Taiwan in 1990. How can this huge discrepancy in comparative sales be explained. To begin with, Gao Xingjian's translators, with their strong academic and literary networks, aggressively promoted their translations and the author. However, Gao Xingjian was not a well-known writer in Taiwan, and he did little to promote the Chinese edition of Soul Mountain himself. This was largely because he was living in Paris and also because the 1990s was a decade of intense uh, creativity for him. And it was by living as a virtual recluse that he set out to and succeeded in recouping the lost years of his creative life, apart from creating a significant number of artworks and directing performances of some of his plays. By 1990, he had published 10 major new works, including a second novel, Igor and Shengjing, One Man's Bible, and his spectacular modern Peking opera, Bai Yishe, uh, Snow in August in 2000. Notwithstanding the above considerations, 
My suggestion is that the most important reason for the poor sales of the Chinese edition of Soul Mountain is probably to be found in the novel itself. Although written in Chinese, the language is somehow unlike that of other contemporary Chinese writings. And the mode of narration that used pronouns instead of uh, characters with names was just a bit too unusual for Chinese readers. While a small dedicated number of Chinese readers would read modern authors such as Kafka, either in the original or in translation, because of its Western, that is, uh, superior to Chinese branding, or because of its promotion by literary critics in the West, I would suggest that there was some form of psychological resistance to reading what could be described as a Kafkaesque novel written in Chinese at that particular time. While the reception of Gaoxing Zhen's writings may interest his publisher, his translator or the academic researcher, it is of little consequence for the author. In his essay, um, Leng De Wenxue, 1990, Cold Literature, he notes that Cao Shiqin and Kafka had not seen their writings published in their lifetime. In 2000, when he won the Nobel, in, in his Nobel speech, he said much the same thing. He said, I'm lucky to have survived and to see my works published. So these writers had written solely for their own personal pleasure and not for monetary payment or social approval. And this is clearly the stance that Gottingen adopts as a writer. Kafka's name occurs often in Gottingen's essays on literature and most recently in his essay, Zhuzha de Weizhi, The Position of the Writer, that he wrote in 2007. For him, Kafka signalled the birth of modern literature because of his accurate portrayal of man's predicament in modern society. For him, man is nothing more than an insect. Kafka was writing at the beginning of the 20th century and a century later, at the beginning of the 21st century, in Gaoxing Zhen's view, the situation for the individual had, in fact, worsened. He says that the autonomy of the individual is progressively eroded as he vanishes into obscurity within one or another group identity. It is only in serious literary creations uh, that can transcend financial gain and politics that the voice of the individual can be heard and in which the individual can preserve his independence and integrity. Such a frail person who possesses neither power nor capital is more or less the same as an insect in the huge social machine of the present. Although he is different from an insect, precisely because he has the capacity to think, yet the individual must be aware of this and be able to exercise this capacity to think. The following essays indicate how Soul Mountain is significantly different from any established mode of Chinese narrative fiction and why the Chinese language used in the novel is different from that of most contemporary Chinese writings. In Wen Shi Yishan Shi, Guan Yu Ling Shan, Literature and Metaphysics about Ling Shan that he wrote in 1991, he describes himself as a product of Han Chinese culture. And he states that he wanted to write the novel in Chinese. However, he found that the Chinese written language had lost its audio appeal because it had become riddled with, what he said, undiluted Western morphology and syntax. He blamed this deplorable state of the language on linguists 
who had standardized the Chinese language by using the morphology and syntax of Western languages in their explanations. Writers who had unwittingly imitated poor translations of Western authors and literary critics who had promoted these poor translations as a modern literary style. To find an uncontaminated form of the language, he turned to the oral folk literary traditions and practices, as well as to various local dialects. His search also took him to the writings of Feng Monglong, uh, 1574 to 1645, and Jin Sheng Tan, 1608 to 1661, who he declared to be masters of language. Feng Monglong had used the living language in his writings, while Jin Sheng Tan had made the dead language of books come to life. He further observed that when read aloud, Jin Sheng Tan's narrative language resonated and was infused with movement and flowing rhythms. This made him realize that sound is the soul of language. So he resolved to restore the musicality of the sounds and rhythms inherent in the tonal nature of the Chinese language in his writing. To this end, he devised the strategy of first drafting his chapters on a tape recorder and listening carefully to it, and only afterwards converting the sentences into written text. In that essay, he also explains his unique fiction aesthetics that is based on his analysis of, on the inherent nature of language. Stream of consciousness in Western literature begins with a subject, and as the writer captures the psychological processes of the subject, there is a resulting flow of language. From this, he suggests that the language of literature could be regarded as a flow of language. He had observed that by changing the pronoun to you and he, the subject is endowed with different angles of perception. So this changing of pronouns would form the linguistic structure of Soul Mountain that he described as a long soliloquy in which the pronouns keep changing in this flow of language. The third person, she, is the male subject's thoughts regarding the opposite sex. From his readings in Chinese literature, he concludes that the purest spirit of Chinese culture is embodied in Taoism and Chan Buddhism, and that this is demonstrated in their clever play with language. Acknowledging the insights he had gained from Zhuangzi and the Chinese translation of the Diamond Sutra, he asserts that while his perceptions are those of someone living in modern times, it is this spirit of Chinese culture that he seeks to recapture in the modern language. He is intent on writing something fresh and innovative, but he rejects the modernist stance of trampling on literary antecedents and the uncritical negation of tradition. He also acknowledges that he gained insights from Pu Songling, Shi An, Cao Shiqin, Liu Er, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Proust, Kafka, and Joyce, as well as some French nouveau roman writers. But he states categorically that this does not prevent him from searching for his own mode of narration. He rejects theories of fiction and states that he knows of no good writer who has benefited from theorists. It is his view that theorists do nothing more than formulate rigid models and create fashions, and that even the notions of plot and characterization are merely popularly agreed upon concepts. For him, the form of fiction is spontaneous and the unique creation of the author. In other words, his novel Soul Mountain does not conform to the traditional practices either of China or the West.
based on three trips along the Yangtze in 1983 and 1984, the longest being 15,000 kilometres, Seoul Mountain incorporates Chinese indigenous narrative traditions into a modern Chinese novel that is informed by modern Western literary novels in its concern for the psychological activities of the protagonist, who is none other than himself. His sustained use of pronouns in this 563-page uh, autobiographical novel has no antecedents. He wrote Soul Mountain to experience the joy of writing, that is, the exhilaration of translating his rich, nonverbal psychic reality into the Chinese language. In our conversations over the past 20 years, Gao Xingzhen at times has mentioned the infinite things crammed in his head, all of which demanded actualization. These things that constitute his psychic reality are born of his cognition, intelligence and curiosity and have continued to proliferate endlessly through his experiences, thinking and imagination. He further reflects on, the, uh, on his writing of Soul Mountain in another essay, Xianda Han Yu Yuan Xie Zuo, The Modern Chinese Language and Literary Creation, 1996. He sees writing first as a search for the music of language and secondly as a search for content, characters, structure and thought. In preparing to write, he chooses music that he wants to hear. It is music that allows him to enter a mental state for writing. And when the right language has been found, the sentences to be recorded or written become audible. He can actually hear them. And like musical phrases are no longer an arrangement of concepts and views that depend on thinking. He had experienced the musicality in the language of Proust and Brecht in their articulation of psychological perceptions. So it is musicality in the Chinese language that he wants to achieve in writing about his own psychological perceptions. What became clear to him was that any language involving sound must be actualized in the flow of linear time. One word comes after the other. Um, and this is just like music. But whereas music and drama can be polyphonic, this is not possible in fiction. Nonetheless, he maintains that in certain linguistic contexts, it is possible for the writer to create meaning, that is, to create a tension that can induce a feeling, a mood or psychological space. In this essay, he lists the linguistic measures that he used to purify the Chinese language in his writing. In fact, these measures bring his language closer to the spoken Chinese language he states that he strives for succinctness and clarity by eliminating adjectives and other attributives where possible and separating into short sentences any components that clutter up the principal clause. He also discards all non-essential elements in sentences, such as adverbial and verbal suffixes, and he tries to make every Chinese character function to its fullest potential. If a monosyllabic verb can replace the disyllabic verb with the same meaning, he will choose the monosyllabic verb. On the premise that writing, reading and actualization of language are all psychological activities, and that to observe or comment on an object are not passive acts, Gao Xingzhen proceeds to argue that a person is not like a camera that does nothing more than mechanically release a shutter or lens. The eyes of the person behind the camera are constantly choosing images 
adjusting the focus and the line of vision, uh, and the focus is always shifting. If one uses the language to describe an image in front of one's eyes, it is a process, even if it is a case of a so-called objective description. In the eyes of a living person, there are no purely objective images, and even if the person is detached, there will be feelings and an image will evoke responses. To capture an image in language is complex, and because the process relies on language, the writing includes naming and making judgments and associations. He notes that 77 of the 81 chapters of Soul Mountain are devoted to such observations, and that it was his intention to find a form of Chinese that could express the psychological processes involved. To use language to capture mental images is even more difficult, and being more ephemeral than anything observable in the external world Pursuing these in language is virtually impossible. He says this is why he does not des describe dream states and only the impressions left by dream that he arranges in a flow of language. For Go Xing Jen, literature is a way of describing human existence, so it is necessarily associated with human feelings. If the language of literature does not have human feelings and is only form for the sake of form or language for the sake of language, he says, it will be an empty shell of language that in time will turn into a heap of linguistic garbage. On the other hand, ancient Greek tragedy and Shakespeare, Savants, Quixote, um, Dante's Divine Comedy, Goethe's Faust, Kafka and Joyce all employ different linguistic forms but they remain as testimonies to human existence. Um, also the writings of Li Bai and Cao Zhuqin continue to evoke feelings in the people of today. In other words, literature can transcend time. The brief outlines uh, in the above demonstrate that Goshen Jen's understanding of literary creation is without linguistic, spatial or temporal borders. His readings across linguistic boundaries have inevitably made use of translations. Unlike most writers, he also cogently discusses his goals and rationale for writing uh, what I want to talk about now is to try to better understand the process by which he translates his rich, nonverbal psychic reality into literature and how he has internalised literary influences through his wide reading and interrogation of literatures in other languages that he has accessed through the originals or through French or Chinese translations. Although this discussion refers specifically to Gaoxing Zhen, it is maintained that in the globalised and highly digitalised world of the present, writers with a deep commitment to literary explorations will also actively access writings in other languages, either by learning other languages and reading the originals, or by reading translations. For this investigation, uh, I've en enlisted the help of Carl Gustav Jung, the psychologist, and Octavio Paz, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1990. His description of uh, listening to appropriate music to achieve the right mental state before writing that he mentions in his essay, The Modern Chinese Language and Literary Creation, indicates that by listening to certain music, he enters a transcendental state in which his creative self is liberated from his everyday self and is given full autonomy to create. This is something like um, 
Chinese opera when the actor comes on stage and he shakes his hand and he sort of goes into another person. And Gottingen actually uses that sort of barrier um, in his own writing, in, when he starts writing. And he also does the same thing with his training of actors to perform his plays. This bifurcation of the public and the creative persona in the creative writer occurs naturally in most serious writers, although probably only a few possess a heightened awareness of it, and even fewer who have written about it. However, more than half a century earlier in China, Lu Xun, 1881-1936, had intuited this. His writings played a major role in establishing China's modern literature during the May 4th era. And he had experienced the sheer ecstasy of literary creation. However, determined to play a role in politics, he had no alternative but to allow his creative self to commit suicide. The poems of his collection, Ye Cao, Wild Grass, written, uh, published in 1927, document the extreme agony he experienced as he observed the death of an integral part of himself. The process of suicide would last from the writing of his first poem, Chu Ye, Autumn Night, on the 15th of September 1924, until the writing of his foreword for the volume on the 26th of April 1927. He was fully aware that thereafter he would exist as a corpse with his heart gouged out, as described in the poem Mu Jie Wen, the epitaph written on 27th of June 1925. On the other hand, sharing Kafka's view of the insignificance of the individual in society, Gaoxing Zhen resolutely commits his pen to literature. Lu Xun, the writer, was crushed by Lu Xun, the politician. And in Ga Xingzhen's view, this was a tragedy for Chinese literature. This bifurcation of the persona of the creative writer is explained by Jung, who maintains that the creative being is a human being with a personal life, but who is simultaneously an impersonal creative process. Art is a kind of innate drive that seizes the human being and makes him an instrument. That's a quote. The artist is not a person with a free will seeking after his own ends, but a person who allows art to realise its purpose through him. As an artist, he is man in a higher sense. He is collective man. Jung further identifies the visionary poet who taps the primordial unconscious. The visionary mode of creation derives its existence from the hinterland of man's mind, but it has psychic reality and therefore physical reality. The artist or writer penetrates to that matrix in which all men are embedded, which imparts a common rhythm to all human existence and allows the individual to communicate his feelings and strivings to mankind as a whole. Jung had been influenced by Chinese philosophy and his description of the visionary poet bears much in common with the Chinese notion of the sage as understood in Song Dynasty Confucianism that included many elements of uh, Buddhism and Taoism. Moreover, the Zhuangzi, with its notion of the untrammeled self that is in harmony with nature, is a book that has inspired creative minds in China throughout the ages, right up to present times. In any case, it would seem that as creative writers, both Gao Xingzhen and Lu Xun could be considered examples of visionary poets as defined by Jung. Of course, it's impossible to verify that Ga Xingzhen does in fact reach the hinterland of man's mind, but I propose that it's highly likely that he does. 
What can be verified is Golshingen's significant erudition across cultures that is evident in his writings. His creations are informed by his voracious reading that began from early childhood. A precocious reader, he read his way through the sizable family library that also included many books on European literature and art, as well as Chinese translations of Western authors. His father worked for the Bank of China under the Nationalists, and he said that when um, the government, Nationalist government was evacuated to the south, to Chongqing, his family library travelled under armed escort <laughs> all the way and back. He also said as a young child he was reading adult books. In 1957, he luckily enrolled into a five-year degree course in French literature at the Foreign Languages Institute in Beijing. He originally wanted to do uh, art, to study art at university, but when he realised that he'd only be painting propaganda posters, he thought it was better to study French. So throughout the 50s, late 50s, while the censors were progressively removing Chinese books from the library shelves throughout the country, Gaoxing Zhen, who was a quick reader, was borrowing a shelf of French books from the library shelves uh, of the Institute Library. There were not so many censors who could read French, you see. He claims that when he graduated in 1962, virtually every book in the library had his signature. Over five years of intensive study, he read widely in French literature as well as French translations of other European authors. Importantly, his reading of European writings was neither passive nor purely academic, because even as an undergraduate, he harboured serious literary aspirations. Through closely interrogating European narrative and dramaturgical traditions, in the context of his extensive knowledge of Chinese literary traditions, he began to write in secret for his personal enjoyment. It was dangerous for him to present his writings to publishers or even to share them with friends because they deviated from the prescribed guidelines for literary production. At the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, he burned a suitcase of his unpublished manuscripts a novella, a large number of short stories, plays and poems, rather than risk having them found by red guards and used as evidence against him. However, his inner drive for self-expression in literature was insatiable and he devised ingenious strategies that allowed him to continue to write in secret. Um, he would hollow out a bamboo stick so that he'd write on thin paper and if anyone disturbed him, he'd quickly roll it up and cram it into a stick and then in the end, he'd, his piles of manuscripts, um, he would bury in the earth and co cover over with a heavy vat of water. It was only after the Cultural Revolution had ended, when Gauteng was 40 years of age, that he saw his first writings published. However, as he had resolutely sustained his explorations and literary creation during the Cultural Revolution, even if it was for his eyes only, he had continued to go through that process of writing and had continued to internalise and consolidate his thinking on literary creation. His writing is not based only on the reading of literary works, but also on his interrogation of narrative technique, dramaturgy, theatre practice, and even actor performance, as they had evolved in both China and the West. And he began to publish in these areas of specialisation from the late 1970s.
In other words, he didn't just want to tell a story. He was very interested in how you told the story, how you made what you wanted to uh, put across to reading audience or the watching audience of a play, how to make it as close to as possible to being real. The essays contained in his recent volume, The Aesthetics of Creation, um, published in 2008, demonstrate the extent of his profound erudition and also tracks how he had developed his innovative breakthrough in literary creation. It is posited that Gaoxing Zhen's interrogation of Chinese and Western literature, as well as his decades of exploration into the practice of writing, nurtured in him a unique literary aesthetics uh, and aesthetic sensibility that formed part of his psychic reality. The creative act may be regarded as the translation of nonverbal psychic reality into a specific language while co-opting thoughts, ideas, memories, fantasies, emotions, perceptions, sensations, and the imagination to form genres of literature, art, music, film, or performance. He has demonstrated that his talents cross those uh, a number of genre, but our concern is with literature here. And his preference is to write in the Chinese language, although uh, he has written a number of plays, first in French, before translating them into um, Chinese. <clears throat> but being the author, he's quite free to change it a bit here and there. While Gaoxing Zhen makes reference to numerous writings that have inspired him, he nowhere explores the process of how he has internalised these works so that they became a part of his psychological reality. Presumably he has never felt the need to think about this. In this regard, the observations of 1990 Nobel laureate Octavio Paz on the impact of writers of the past and from other cultures may elucidate how similar influences probably took shape in Gaoxing Zhen's psychic reality. It must nonetheless be borne in mind that Gaoxing Zhen's absorption of European literary influences began early in life, in fact significantly earlier than Paz's journey into Asian literature. Also, Gaoxing Zhen was fluent in French by the time he began to write creatively as an undergraduate student, whereas Paz only began to learn Chinese and Japanese in middle age. Furthermore, Paz had leisurely approached Asian literary influences, whereas Gotting Zhen had embraced European literary influences with a passion during one of the most repressive regimes for writers in Chinese history. It would seem that Gaoxing Zhen's awareness of his self being annihilated during the mass movements of the Cultural Revolution uh, that had contributed to his strong commitment to literature. Writing uh, in his Nobel speech, he said, it was only during this period when literature became utterly impossible that I came to understand why it was so essential Literature allows a person to preserve a human consciousness. Understanding the importance of literature in translation, Paz notes that in modern times, man has separated from man because of language. Quote, the language that enables us to communicate with one another also encloses us in, in an invisible web of sounds and meanings so that each nation is imprisoned by its language, a language further fragmented by historical eras, by social classes and by generations. He refuses to be captive of language. He read widely in translations. In 
his collection, One Word to the Other, um, he writes of the impact of his, of his intensive readings in Chinese and Japanese literature from about 1962. He sees translation and creation as twin processes with constant interactions and that European poetry consists of convergences of various traditions in Western poetry that include Japanese haiku and Chinese poetry. For him, styles are translinguistic. Quote, they are coalescent and pass from one language to another. In an essay called Translation, Literature and Letters, Paz makes the following statements that reinforce the notion of the bifurcated persona of the creative writer, as noted by Jung and demonstrated in the case of uh, Göttingen and Lu Xun. Paz maintains that it is the poem and not the poet that counts. The poem exists at the expense of the poet. The poet who writes the poem is not the same person who goes under that name. The real person, no matter how fugitive his reality, possesses a physical, social and psychic consistency and a body and a face that respond to a name. Whereas the poet is not a real person, he is a fiction, a figure of speech. Focusing on the poet's use of language to express reality, he goes on to say, the poet immersed in the movement of language in constant verbal preoccupation chooses a few words or is chosen by them. On the understanding that literary creation is the act of the creative persona that is divorced from the everyday person of the, of the creative writer, as advanced by both Jung and Paz, and supported by Gaoxing Zhen's own account of his entering a transcendental state, it is therefore maintained that Gaoxing Zhen becomes an instrument of creation. During this process of creativity, he, the writer, is engaged in translating into language the rich nonverbal psychic reality that, as described by Paz, is a coalescence of the writings of literary ghosts who, disregarding linguistic, spatial or temporal borders, exist in what Jung has named the hinterland of the inner mind that is shared by all human beings. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.